In today's podcast, we revisit the great first blockbuster movie in the history of cinema. The Civil War, slavery, the KKK, a president drawn into the publicity campaign, Birth of a Nation had it all. But what really made it a blockbuster? That is our topic today on Footnoting History. Hello, this is Esther, and welcome to Footnoting History. D.W. Griffith and his Birth of a Nation is a blockbuster in every sense of the term. Its running length of three hours plus made it one of the longest, if not the longest film ever made when it premiered in 1915. Its success at the box office, despite protests and some attempts at banning it, made it the highest grossing picture until it was surpassed by another Civil War epic drama, Gone with the Wind. Its innovative techniques, with dramatics, close-up montages, and extended sequences made it groundbreaking in communicating the moving image in such a heightened and engaging fashion. Its marketing campaign did not have the strength of social media behind it like blockbuster movies do today, but it did have its one-man publicity machine behind it, author Thomas Dixon, whose book The Klansman was the inspiration for the movie. Even the title, The Birth of a Nation, promised an epic, blockbuster story, one that tells of the American Civil War and the South's defeat and its subsequent reconstruction being those defining moments that made the United States a true union instead of a patchwork of small, loosely connected states. But what made this a real blockbuster, in the humble opinion of this podcaster, was its uncanny ability to mix art, commerce, groundbreaking film techniques, and most of all, propaganda to reflect on America's history in order to comment on its future, as it faced the challenges of building an empire, and especially that in the Philippines, the influx of immigrants, and a progressive era in which women were close to achieving the vote. The first title card of the restored picture, which was added later, was full of ambition and promise, and it reflected the blockbuster status the film had attained since its release in 1915. It said, the birth of a nation produced in 1914 still stands as the yardstick by which all great motion pictures are measured. D.W. Griffith had a very high opinion of himself, and much like the author of the original novel upon which his film was based, had a very kind of arrogant view of his own work and the potential of film as a medium. Griffith once said that in the future, public libraries would no longer carry history books with their often conflicting opinions, but rather movies like Birth of a Nation, which would just show history in all of its visual glory. In the original title card, Griffith puts out a plea to his audience about censorship, telling them that great art should have no censors, and basically implying that Birth of a Nation is about at the same level as the Bible and the works of Shakespeare. No humble man he was. And D.W. Griffith certainly thought his picture had a wide appeal because, as he said in the short interview prior to the re-release of his movie, it was a story of people fighting desperately against great odds, great sacrifices, suffering, and death. But whose great sacrifices? Whose suffering? What was the birth of a nation really about? Well, let's start off with the basic plot here. The story starts off with two families in antebellum America, that is, America before the Civil War, the Stonemans and the Camerons. The Stonemans are from the North, and the Camerons are from the South. The beginning scenes of the film show the Stoneman brothers visiting the plantation of their friends, the Camerons, in Piedmont, South Carolina. Everything is peaceful, families are happy, couples are falling in love, and most importantly for the film's ideological standpoint, the slaves, many of whom are actors in blackface, are content and happy with their lot in life. The patriarch of the Stoneman clan, Austin Stoneman, who's standing in for real-life Pennsylvania congressman Thaddeus Stevens, is, along with the blacks who are later freed in the film, I suppose the main antagonist of the film. He is the rabble-rousing lover of colored people who's having an affair with his mulatto housekeeper. Even though it is likely that Thaddeus Stevens did have a long and intimate relationship with his housekeeper, the culprit of breaching the sacred race lines that divided white and black was purposely transposed onto the northern character of Austin Stoneman, 
perhaps as a subconscious ploy to distance white Southern men from the charge that they often had relations with their black female slaves, which, you know, they did. So, the Stone Man and Cameron brothers go off to war once the South secedes from the Union, and North, represented by the Stonemans, are pitted against the South, represented by the Camerons, brother versus brother. After some very impressive battle sequence, intercut with scenes of anxious family members just waiting to hear news from the front, the Civil War ends in the defeat for the South. But really, what the film is trying to tell us, it has destroyed all of the nation, both regions, including President Lincoln's life, whose assassination Griffith made sure to show as accurately as possible. So the country can begin rebuilding, but not without significant growing pains for what will become the birth of the new American nation. Indeed, the troubles and anxiety certainly began with Lincoln's assassination, which allowed, as Griffith made sure to point out in one of the title cards that quoted President Woodrow Wilson's History of the American People, for the white South to come under the heel of the black South. Indeed, according to the film, the rising of black power in the South began when Union, when the Union Army and the side of President Lincoln decided to arm black militia soldiers. There are scenes of black soldiers uh, destroying Piedmont and ransacking the Cameron's peaceful plantation house, but the real damage wrought by the new freedoms given to these ex-slaves is fully laid out in the second part of the epic, in which they gradually but steadily corrode the moral, racial, and political fabric of Southern society. These, um, the so-called uh, mulattoes, the mixed race uh, black people, and the freed blacks, most of whom were actors in varying degrees of blackface, white actors in blackface, begin calling for equal rights and equal marriage, which was code for the black man wanting to defile white women's purity. The film goes on. They eventually get a voice and a vote in politics, making the sacred temples of democracy a forum for disorderly and crass behavior. Free blacks then somehow become strong enough to intimidate white men from voting and disenfranchising them, uh, lastly, and then... The very, very last indignity, the straw that breaks the camel's back, is that they begin to rape white women. This is the view of Reconstruction, according to D.W. Griffith and author Thomas Dixon. Now let's think of the infamous scene where the character Gus, played by the white actor Walter Long in blackface, targets the young Cameron daughter for marriage, meaning, according to the film, he wants to marry her because he wants to have sexual relations with her. He pursues her. She screams and runs away. There's this animalistic look in his eye that tells us, the audience, that he will stop at nothing until the deed is done. So, to escape him, she climbs up this ravine, and in the original cut of the film, he does indeed get his uh, way with her. But in the final censored version, the one everyone has seen, she falls to her death before she lets that degenerate Gus violate her body and her virtue. There's a very insidious message here, to say the least. The message here is that black men will want to marry and rape white women, and white women should go to their deaths to defend their honor. Of course, the irony here is that white men, particularly the Ku Klux Klan, who are the heroes of this story, and I'll get to them in a second, they often targeted black women for sexual assault in the post-bellum South in an attempt to reassert slave-era control over their bodies. And so we go on. It is the death and attempted rape of this young Cameron girl, which incites her older brother, Ben Cameron, uh, who's a Civil War veteran, to action. Ben Cameron comes home to this topsy-turvy world, as we can call it, and he decides that he has enough, and he begins to put on the robes of the Ku Klux Klan, who are the heroes of Griffith's story and Thomas Dixon's novel. And the Ku Klux Klan are there to save the South from the dangers and the rapacity of the freed blacks, who are the tools of men like Austin Stoneman, who, if you remember, is standing in for Thaddeus Stevens, who himself is the tool of his mulatto housekeeper, who uses her sexuality to bewitch and influence him. After a huge battle, this is the climax of the movie, in which the KKK is uh, victorious, uh, they help save the damsel in distress, and uh, they block access of free blacks to the ballot box, and the movie ends with order restored. The Ku Klux Klan has inspired fear into blacks who have dared to get uppity, and the Camerons and the Stonemans are united by marriage, one brother marrying one sister from each family. 
The nation has not only been born, but also saved before it could be killed in its crib. So this was a real blockbuster. It broke records because so many people saw it, and so many people paid the outrageous two-dollar ticket price to see it, which amounts to nearly fifty dollars in today's money. The film was successful largely in part because I think it told its story so damn well. I think what makes a propaganda film like this so good at being propaganda for a particular view of history is that it had this veneer of historical truth that allowed audiences to be both entertained and, in a sense, get educated or, in this sense, get indoctrinated in that point of view. Griffith obviously took inspiration from Dixon's novel, but. Interspersed throughout the film are title cards that claim historical authenticity on the matter, sourcing history books for quotes such as Woodrow Wilson's History of the American People,、uh, using primary sources such as photographs and other documents of historical importance, facsimiles as Griffith called them, as inspiration for the staging and plotting of the scenes. The plot may have been complex for a film of its time. Historical scenes, battles, and family drama were all juxtaposed one after another in a seamless narrative with intricate detail. But like a true piece of propaganda, its message is very simple: black misrule and white carpet bagging threatened postbellum America and was only put ripe by the white South, exemplified by the KKK, reasserting its dominance. In other words, whites and blacks can never ever be equal. And whites should be on top. The technical breakthroughs for this film、uh, were also a wonder to behold, and made the propaganda, the message of the film, that much more engaging and that more, much more realistic. Griffith didn't necessarily invent the cinematic techniques that we see in this film, but he used them to such a great effect after experimenting with some of them in in his earlier films and some of that which he did invent in his earlier films that he may as well had invented them for Birth of a Nation. His use of the montage as a tool for showing simultaneous action, the iris shot, which drew attention to one particular part of the shot while blacking out the unimportant bits, the dramatic close-ups. All of these were seemingly perfected in *Birth of a Nation* and was part of its great artistic achievement. His next film, *Intolerance*, which was released in 1916, was apparently the first film to employ flashbacks, a narrative technique that is very, very difficult to erase from our cinematic lexicon today. In fact, Griffith was accustomed in thinking in terms of shots rather than scenes. Which would allow the medium of film to go beyond the theater, as most film directors at the time treated cinematic narratives similar to play acting on a stage. But film, Griffith recognized, was not a stage. The medium was a vehicle for so much more, and *Birth of a Nation* was proof of that. Even with its technical breakthroughs, epic visuals and battle scenes, and its provocative take on history. The success of *Birth of a Nation* was not guaranteed, as a movie that big needed a publicity machine behind it that was just as formidable. This is where Thomas Dixon comes into our story. His novel, the full title, which was *The Klansman: An Historical Romance of the Ku Klux Klan*, was published in 1905 and then later adapted into a successful stage play. Dixon himself was ardent and zealous about his ideas. About the Civil War and Reconstruction, and felt that novels and stage plays, despite finding success in both mediums, were very limited in what they could communicate to audiences, and that these newfangled motion pictures was the way of the future. And he wasn't half wrong there. Dixon had tried to pitch *The Klansman* to producers for years before he met D.W. Griffith. And was repeatedly rejected because his story was overlong, too ambitious, and way too controversial. Griffith was the only producer willing to take a shot at it, and not only because he was enraptured by Dixon's work, but because the material spoke to Griffith's past in a very deep and personal way. His father was a Confederate soldier during the Civil War who often spoke of the glory days, even though he never amounted to much after the war. Both Griffith and Dixon grew up with these stories, and both were determined to show that if the South 
could not rise again in reality, at least it could on celluloid. Griffith was unable to pay the $10,000 Dixon was asking for adapting his work, but Griffith could offer him a 25% interest in the film, probably one of the reasons why Dixon was such a passionate promoter and apparently was the one who suggested that the title of the film be changed from The Klansman to Birth of a Nation. That deal, might I add, also made Dixon a millionaire. So despite its incredible success at the box office, the film did face very strong opposition from some quarters, especially from Moorfield Story, one of the leaders of the NAACP, or the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, who had been challenged by Griffith to find any historical inaccuracies in the film when he complained about it. And by the way, Mr. Story did find historical inaccuracies. Griffith ignored him and extended a handshake instead, which Mr. Story then refused. Dixon himself was quite resourceful and did what he could to counter any sort of negative press that the film might receive. He thought that enlisting President Woodrow Wilson's support would nullify any critiques of the film, because who would dare to go against the president's opinion, or at least question the president's opinion, especially when he's a well-known scholar like Woodrow Wilson? Dixon happened to know President Wilson from their days at Johns Hopkins University, when President Wilson was a graduate student and Dixon was an undergraduate student. And he was able to have the film screened at the White House for his old friend on February 18, 1915. After the screening, the president allegedly remarked these words, It is like writing history with lightning, and my only regret is that it is all so terribly true. Well, President Wilson may have had a high opinion of the film, seeing how Griffith quoted him in the title cards and Dixon was a friend of his, but we don't know if he actually said those words, though Dixon made sure the press knew he did. And when he floated the idea that the President, Congress, and the Supreme Court were behind the film, the censorship board in New York withdrew its objections. This didn't necessarily mean that there wasn't strong opposition from other quarters, such as from social progressives like Jane Addams, who was the founder of Hull House, or even from other censorship boards, but the near-universal acclaim it garnered from critics and reviewers in the papers also seemed to bolster its popularity and essentially guaranteed the film's continuing good press. So, to hammer home the idea that this film was propaganda for a particular view of history, we must also consider that the Ku Klux Klan had its second revival following the popularity of the film. The first iteration of the KKK, which uh, arose in the tumult of Reconstruction and was depicted in the film, had been, by at least 1915, long gone. But in the excitement of the birth of the nation, the rebirth of the KKK in Georgia appeared with a renewed mission to keep America racially pure and dominated by whites. But this time, Catholics and Jews, the majority of whom had come to America in the postbellum years among the ways of Irish, Italian, and Russian immigrants, were added to the list of the KKK's enemies. It wasn't just blacks anymore. The demographics of the U.S. had changed drastically since the Civil War, especially in the big cities. America's strength abroad in light of its victory in the Philippine-American War a decade or so earlier also reinforced the fact that while the South had completely lost its complete and total right to subjugate Black people as a matter of economic and social policy, America as a nation was still strong in quashing potential misrule and revolutionary activity that sought to diminish its authority, especially its authority abroad and in its colony. The independence of the free blacks who became, under Reconstruction, insolent and chaotic according to the ideology of the film, demonstrated how history could become prophecy if the Philippines could also manage to secure their independence from the United States. America had to stay strong in the face of its many challenges, domestic or international, which meant, according to Griffith and Dixon, a social order where women knew their place, non-whites knew theirs, and white men were in positions of power. The great movie critic Roger Ebert had written a series of essays on great films in the history of cinema, and about Birth of a Nation, he wrote the following. All serious moviegoers must sooner or later arrive at a point where they see a film for what it is and not simply for what they feel about it. 
The Birth of a Nation is not a bad film because it argues for evil. Like Riefenstahl's The Triumph of the Will, it is a great film that argues for evil. To understand how it does so is to learn a great deal about film and even something about evil. I would like to expand on Roger Ebert's sentiment by adding that Birth of a Nation is a great film that argues for a very particular view of history. To understand how it makes its arguments through visuals, melodrama, and the careful recreation of historical scenes based on the memories of a once great South is to learn a great deal about propaganda films and even something about how Americans looked at their history. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find links to further reading suggestions related to this week's episode, as well as a calendar of upcoming podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Until next time, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes. See you next week.